Welcome to Leading with Empathy and Allyship. I'm Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Impovia, formerly Change Catalyst. I'm also the author of How to Be an Ally and your host for this show. Allyship is empathy in action. We learn what people are uniquely experiencing, we show empathy for their experience, and we take action. Want to learn more? Visit empovia.co, E-M-P-O-V-I-A dot co, to check out more of my work. Let's get started. Today, our guest is Sandra Camacho, who is an inclusive design consultant, educator, and strategist at Sandra by Design. She started a career at Google working on product innovation and learning and development, and left to pursue her dreams of designing for social impact. So she currently helps product and design teams around the world to build thriving work cultures and socially impactful solutions. Today, we'll be discussing how products can reinforce the underlying patterns of oppression and how we can build anti-oppressive products, services, and technology. So welcome, Sandra. Looking forward to this important conversation. Thank you, Melinda, for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. Awesome. So before we go deep into our conversation, let's describe ourselves for anybody who's blind or low vision and and on YouTube. So I, I will, I'll start. I'm a white woman with long red and blonde hair. I'm wearing glasses and a orange sleeveless shirt. And in my background on one side is a, a long, a tall, skinny bookshelf with a plant cascading down it. And on the other side, I have uh, my book, how to be an ally with a bright orange cover and some plants surrounding it. Wonderful. So I am a light olive skin Latino woman with dark brown hair and brown eyes. I am wearing a dark colored shirt with a range of patterns. Uh, and in the background, you can see a little bit in the distance, a bit blurred, um, some dividing kind of lines between my office and my living room. And I'm also wearing airpods. Awesome. awesome. Excellent. And our interpreters today are from Interpreter Now, Ruby and Dana here today. You can learn more about them at www.interpreter-now.com. Sandra, let's start with your story. Where did you grow up and what was the path that led you to do the work that you do now? Yeah. So I love I was about to say I love talking about myself, but why I love talking about my personal journey is because it's so intricately connected with the work that I do today. And the biggest part of that is because I have grown up and lived in many different countries and kind of constantly shift across languages. And so where I was born was in South America, in Colombia, where I have a big, big extended family. They're all still there. But my close family and I, parents and siblings, moved to the U.S. when I was about six years old. And I got the chance to kind of experience America as an immigrant, a very young immigrant, kind of learning the ropes of American culture and how to speak English and how to assimilate into my new surroundings. And I would say that I didn't know this at the time, but it was many years later that I discovered that the city that, I, that we moved to was actually fairly conservative. And why I mentioned this is because I had a lot of identity issues growing up, kind of being caught between American and Colombian culture, between English and Spanish, and not really necessarily knowing or understanding my place and who I really was and where I could be accepted and where I could belong. And it wasn't until about high school and even college years that I started to really unpack these larger systems that, that we're living in. So kind of multiculturalism, colonialism, racism, xenophobia, all these sorts of things that I didn't really understand when I was a kid. They started to really become a lot more clear to me once I started studying them. So I ended up studying international relations in French, but focusing on politics and culture and identity. In a way, it was because of my own journey and trying to understand myself and ultimately kind of a love for foreign cultures and foreign languages took me to France, which is where I live today. Awesome. And how did you end up doing the work that you do now? Where did, how did, what was that path? What did that path look like? Yeah. I mean, I would say that there are kind of a couple of different routes to how I've gotten here because right now everything's intersecting, but it didn't look like that before. <laughs> so it's kind of the the first starting path is really design, and that started when I was a kid. So I'm self-taught designer. I was kind of tinkering on the computer, 
And I was like nine or 10 years old teaching myself how to build websites, how to design graphics. And that became kind of a passion and a hobby. And like I mentioned, I studied um, politics, cultural and identity. So I was already kind of in the DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion world from an academic standpoint, but not necessarily connecting it to a career. And then ultimately uh, worked in tech for quite some time, trying to figure out how do I bring together these passions for culture, for design and, and for social impact, which was also something really important to me. And ultimately how I ended up here was by leaving behind my career at Google. In the midst of that, I, I went back to design school. I got to spend some time at an NGO while I was in school uh, during sabbatical leave. And it was kind of all these disparate things that eventually back in, I would say, 2018 started to come together in intersecting ways, which is what I call inclusive design now. So bringing together the personal passions, design, and then, of course, all the things that I learned in the corporate world and in tech and trying to uh, figure out, you know, how can we start to make change in the world, especially when it comes to building large scale technology and products and services that people use on a day to day basis that aren't necessarily built with everyone in mind. And as you mentioned at the very beginning, that ends, end up perpetuating harms, even unintentionally. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's kind of how I ended up here. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing your story too. There's a, a common theme in a lot of uh, our episodes where people have come from different underrepresented backgrounds, marginalized backgrounds, where with our personal experience really shaping how we end up showing up in the world with our work. Um, so I appreciate that you're sharing that. I wonder if we could go into some definitions first before we go deep into the heart of our topic today. And you mentioned inclusive design. Let's start there. Can you define inclusive design? What does that mean? What does that look like? This is a great question because I've been exploring this for quite some time and trying to actually challenge the ways that inclusive design has been, quote unquote, traditionally defined, um, specifically in tech, but even across industries. And traditionally, inclusive design is seen as a way to bring in more diverse people, especially those who are underrepresented or underserved into the design process in order to value the perspectives and to address their needs in the design process. And I would say that something I've been working on is to actually break down this definition because um, as the topic that we're talking about today refers to, there is no mention of equity, there's no mention of oppression, there's no mention of structural barriers. We're kind of living ourselves to let's just bring in more people and then voila, problems are solved. And we know that the reality isn't that simple. And so I've been, um, you know, I've been exploring new ways to redefine and expand that definition, which I've kind of gravitated towards calling inclusive design, design for social change, which can span across not just diversity and inclusion and accessibility, which are the usual domains that we see associated with inclusive design, but looking to extend that towards equity and justice, towards ethics and care and healing. And really focusing on how can we use inclusive design or just design in general as a way to disrupt oppressive norms and systems to ensure that all sorts of people are able to access, fully benefit from, and find delight in the solutions that we build. So that is my redefined um, definition of inclusive design that is a little bit broader. I love it. I love it. And uh, the world would be a better place if we all <laughs> use products and design products and services that that were more inclusive and used. Maybe you could share a little bit about how we go about inclusive design. What is that? Um, what are the the main components of it? Yeah. So I like to kind of think of it along the lines of a variety of key principles that can help to guide not just designers. And I think I even like to point out the word design in inclusive design because a lot of people tend to automatically think of a professional designer. So an architect, a product designer, a UX designer, a user experience designer, a graphic designer. And I really am part of the camp of folks who sees design as problem solving with creativity and even just kind of making day-to-day -day decisions, but with intent and with thought behind them. And so for me, you know, it kind of starts there, kind of rethinking the design process and who's involved in it. 
A lot Mm -hmm. of the times, historically, products and services and technology are built by people primarily in the corporate sector, private sector, uh, people who have been trained and have gone through certain types of schoolings, who, you know, there are certain sorts of principles and rules for what good design is. And um, the goal with inclusive design practices, we can call it equitable design, anti-oppressive design. There's a lot of names for it. But the goal with that is really to challenge who is doing the designing, who are we designing with instead of just designing for people, you know, coming into community with those, especially who are underrepresented and underserved today. And then figuring out, you know, what are we designing and how are we designing it? How can we start to challenge and disrupt that? And that's, for instance, making sure that we're centering the needs and the voices of marginalized communities, that we're accounting for intersectional identities, meaning that we're not thinking of people as just belonging to one singular identity group, such as all women or all Black folks, but really thinking about the intersections of identity and the fact that when you're designing a product, the way that that product will be experienced is going to be different for someone who, for instance, is Black and disabled compared to someone who is Black and a part of the LGBTQ community or someone who is not Black at all and who has some sort of other marginalized or dominant identity. So it's all about kind of thinking of what's that multiplicity of experiences that we need to design for and how can we ensure that we're bringing those people into the design process and not just including them, but actually shifting power towards them. And I know that's something that we're going to uncover and unpack a bit further later on. But yeah, I would say that's kind of point number three, that it's not just about asking people what they want or uh, doing interviews with people that perhaps we haven't spoken to in the past, but it's actually shifting kind of those wheels of decision making and influence to ensure that, uh, yeah, we're not fording that power, especially amongst those who already have the most privilege and tend to kind of perpetuate the status quo. Yeah, thank you. There's so many examples of products, the tech products in particular, that because they are such a large scale, I think these examples are so prevalent out there in the world and creating harm. You know, just taking Google, for example, several years ago, image search engines identified Black people as gorillas, right? And I just read an article recently that they actually haven't fixed it, <laughs> that the fix so far has been that they just turn it off. So you, if you search for gorillas, not much comes up as a result. And so the, the, the problem hasn't ultimately been fixed. And of course, we're hearing a lot of, uh, you know, when we talk about AI and the dot. Yep very new dominance of AI in all kinds of ways, chat GDP, the reinforcement and amplification of sexist, racist, and ableist, ableist, and also heteronormative stereotypes that are coming out as a result because they're programmed by humans who have (laughs) biases and assumptions. And they're also looking at the historical record of all of those things in the internet. So That's, I think, what we're designing against or kind of redefining um, so that we don't build those things so that we're building them in a new way, right? But maybe you could, could you talk about, when we talk about systems of oppression, what should we be thinking about when we're designing products and services? Yes, these are all great points. And that example, I actually use a lot in my decks and people are so surprised. They're like, what do you mean that people are identified as gorillas? Like it just doesn't even really make sense. And Mm -hmm. that's the problem with a lot of things that these sorts of kind of harmful patterns that perpetuate oppression sometimes tend to fall under the radar because you could say on one hand, you know, there's a lot of talk around unconscious bias. So, Mm -hmm. okay. Um, People tend to design products with a specific default user in mind, or perhaps the team tends to have overrepresentation of certain identities. Uh, so an engineering team may perhaps be predominantly white or male with a certain you know, degree of education, certain socioeconomic status. And so clearly their perspective, the worldview, their assumptions are going to trickle themselves into the technology that they build. And so that that is a, a common argument that I hear. And where I like to challenge that and, and encourage us to move beyond that and to start to think a bit more systemically is to realize that, in fact, 
racism, uh, or I should say, you know, a system that's tied to white supremacy, the cis heteropatriarchy, these larger systems are embedded in all aspects of the world around us. So it's not just a question of individual bias or even team level bias, meaning just a handful of engineers who unknowingly choose data sets that don't have a diverse enough, for instance, diverse enough representation of people across skin tones, uh, across genders, across levels of ability, et cetera. And that's what leads to algorithms that don't uh, necessarily capture the reality of people's real experiences. But to me, that's kind of a limited point of view. And, and as we start to zoom out and out, we start to see, well, part of that is because of hiring, meaning that these teams aren't homogenous just because they're homogenous, but rather because there are structural barriers that make it more difficult for certain individuals from marginalized groups to even enter the industry, of tech, uh, you know, enter the tech industry to get into these teams and to even have decision-making power and influence over those teams. So there have been many instances of a lot of very vocal Black women in AI who have spoken up, not just about culture and about lack of representation, but also about bias and also about inequities that are built into a lot of these technologies that are being built. And they are being gaslit. They are being invalidated. They are even being pushed out of organizations. And, and that's not simply a result of bias. This is active discrimination. This is a reflection of a larger system of this is heteropatriarchy and white supremacy combined that pushes against any sort of challenges against the status quo that dictates, as, as I'm sure you've talked about in previous episodes, that dictates that certain folks have the most degree of power and the most degree of influence. And, and that's how kind of that power balance should stay in place. And so when I start to think about, you know, how can we start to move towards more anti-oppressive products and services and technology and how they're defined, designed, excuse me, we have to be thinking about not just the biases that are embedded in the process, not just about, you know, the sort of assumptions that we make, but thinking about what are the ways that white supremacy, for instance, embeds itself into organizational culture. How might we be perpetuating certain patterns of the patriarchy with regards to who actually makes decisions, who's being listened to within a team? How can we start to, for instance, look at the objectives and maybe the workflows and processes and how they're defined? So thinking about, for instance, the timelines that are set. So a lot of the time when I hear um, pushback for inclusive design or, or what we can also call product inclusion or product equity is that, oh, we don't have time for this. Uh, we don't have time to de-bias or we don't have time to diversify our teams or the people we do research with. We don't have time to kind of unpack, you know, and do some critical thinking about, you know, what are the gaps that we might be, um, we might be overlooking or what are the sorts of harms that we might be generating even unintentionally. And that's what gets me thinking that, well, urgency is also tied to a system and that's the system of capitalism. And so again, we, we start to see that there's all these kind of interlocking pieces you know, that are part of the system that are, are woven into, into how we work. And, and we have to unpack all of those different little pieces and it's going to take time. And the question is kind of how do we get people to buy into this, to understand the value and to, in a way, have enough courage to allow for your team or your, even your leadership to, to take a chance to disrupt the status quo because the world doesn't always react positively. There are, you could say, business risks associated with it, but I would say the rewards in terms of human benefits um, and social benefits uh, far outweigh the business risks and their business benefits as well. But yeah. that's a whole nother, you know, topic. But, yeah, but, yeah, and I would say the business risks in not doing it are pretty significant too, right? Yeah, ultimately. Um, absolutely. You know, one of the things you talked about earlier is empathy. And and I I think there is a system that you haven't meant well, a part of the system that you haven't mentioned yet is that, and I think this is what ha you know, what happens when companies grow, 
you know, have this big, massive Google or big, massive company that you're now trying to to change and you're trying to change the systems and processes that you use in order to build design products and build products. And it starts from the very beginning. We, um, you know, well, I've done a lot of work with entrepreneurs and and designers who often make assumptions about about people. And, and it, I think it's embedded a lot in that initial design process that we teach entrepreneurs <laughs> where, you know, it, it, I, I, you know, the other day I was working with a team of a product team and the designers were like, well, and, and I was talking about empathy and working with them on how to deepen their empathy skills. Yeah. And the designers were like, oh, we know this stuff. <laughs> we're designers. We build empathy maps all the exactly. time. Exactly. <laughs> right. And and so for those of you listening or watching that don't and don't know this, um, many startup models begin that design process with what Steve Blank calls get out of the building, as in go do your user research at the very beginning. And it's usually literally go out of the building and talk to people on the street or and talk to potential users and get an understanding of why they would use your product, how they would use your product. And then you build an empathy map that is a paper map or a digital map where you're looking at their wants and their needs and their pain points and their their potential gains by using your product, right? So there's a lot of those built-in assumptions happening. It's very focused on how do you make money by designing things for, for people. And, and it has a lot of harmful stereotypes, a lot of harmful, potentially systemic issues as well. How do you, because I know you work with designers, how do you work with designers on going beyond that surface level empathy maps, the personas, the customer journeys, and go deeper? It's a big system that you know, we've been using in product and system design for decades, I would say, um, at least the last two decades. Yeah. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head on this because that kind of goes back to, you know, what is good design and mm -hmm. questioning even how we've been taught to design. And I would say like, even thinking of my own background, like I am a self-taught designer, like I did go back to design school, but it was for a design strategy. And then I kind of focused on social design. So I started thinking about questions of, social impact. So when we build something, who's actually being affected or how can we start to drive change in the world with design? And I think when that isn't necessarily happening in a designer's kind of educational path, a lot of the times the way to challenge that is on the job, but then you have a lot of design teams that they don't necessarily have access to education around inclusion or around equity. They're not necessarily thinking about it. If they're even getting exposed to diversity, equity, and inclusion as topics that's happening really more on an HR or kind of culture or people side of things. So for me, that's kind of like, even before we start the actual like doing and implementing and activating, what I like to focus on is on that education. So how can we get designers and anyone that is tangentially connected to the design world? So you could be a marketer or a UX writer an engineer, a data scientist, if you're involved in some sort of way in, develop, in the design or the development of a solution that real people are going to use, to me, this is going to be relevant to you. And so that education piece is understanding kind of what have I been taught about, for instance, who are my target users? <laughs> How do I go about collecting data on those users? And there's this kind of, um, you know, these principles that we get from uh, human-centered design or from user-centricity or user-centered design. And it's this assumption that when we go and talk to people, we're able to assess their needs. We're able to understand and see the world through their eyes, of course, the definition of empathy. And um, to me, it kind of starts from unpacking the fact that empathy is actually very difficult to practice, especially when you are exposed to people who are very different from yourself. And there are a variety of research studies, and I'm happy to share them as a follow-up, that show how difficult it is to conduct research with someone who is different from your tribe, meaning who doesn't look like you, who doesn't come from the same background. There's a lot of things that that, that are happening on an unconscious level where we actually have to actively and very intentionally 
remove ourselves and and figure out kind of how is my own identity, my own worldview, my own perspective bleeding into the types of questions that I ask, the types of interpretations that I make, even the types of people that I end up gravitating towards. Even if you're going out in the field and just talking to people, it's like, well, who do you gravitate towards? There might be some patterns there. Uh, we're not always aware of those patterns. So those are kind of the the smart, small things to start with. So kind of being challenging those preconceived notions or the way that you've been taught, figuring out kind of those small behaviors that uh, you may not be aware of that you're engaging in that may be reflective of potential bias. And then ultimately, I think one thing that we haven't touched upon is even rethinking research altogether. Mm. And what I mean by that is that when we think of research, you're going out, I mean, the most kind of scientific way of describing someone who participates in research is a research subject. And already <laughs> the term subject <laughs> tells us a lot yeah. about the power, the power differentials, dynamics between the mm. researcher and the subject, which it makes me think of like a mouse in a lab. And so, and even if you think of a lot of usability testing, so testing, the usability of a product, it happens in a lab environment. And so there's this notion of hierarchy between the person coming out um, and wanting to learn about the person and the person who's giving information. And when we start to think of, okay, well, the wording has evolved and people call those who participate in research, research participants. But even there, um, when we think of the word participant, Mm. There's a degree uh, or lack of degree of agency involved in that, meaning that I actually don't have a lot of knowledge as to what my data is going to be used for. I don't necessarily have influence over how the data is used, what decisions get made after the fact. No one keeps me in the loop as a research participant, or this happens very infrequently. Uh, a lot of the times when you think of compensation, people aren't necessarily being uh, remunerated for the work that they're doing. They're not necessarily getting recognized. There's not attribution or credit because they are providing insights. They're providing business value. And that in a way is being extracted for them in exchange of sometimes nothing or a gift card, $25, $50, and so all those sorts of things, you know, when you start to look at research through the lens, you realize like, oh, this is actually kind of a, a vehicle for capitalism, the extractive and um, exploitative nature of capitalism to kind of rear its head, meaning we take, we take from people and we label that as human-centered design or human-centered innovation or user insights. But at the end of the day, who's benefiting? And, and that's the kind of taker. So yeah, so I think that there's a lot of work to be done there to kind of start to shift those power dynamics. So instead of seeing people as research subjects or participants, how can we start to see them really more as co-designers, bringing them in into positions with greater degree of agency, where they actually have a say on what's going to be designed, how it's going to be designed. They may not necessarily have the same kind of design, traditional and professional design background, but there's lived experience that is also just as valuable and as insightful, especially when the goal is to design something that as many people can benefit from. There is a wealth of knowledge that should be honorably not extracted from people, but recognized and celebrated and rewarded. So to me, I think that's kind of where there are certain teams and even in large tech companies that are moving more in this direction. They're building product inclusion teams, product equity teams. They're bringing in folks from more diverse communities. They're partnering with research organizations that recruit folks from marginalized communities. They're partnering with nonprofits. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done, but you can't do it all at once. So it's to me, it's starting with, let's just do the education. Let's start just kind of rethinking, questioning, and then the day-to-day -day behaviors, and then ultimately work towards that workflow, that culture change, and ultimately greater systemic change in an organization. Mm. Yeah, I, I heard you shift that, that language, shifting from subjects to participants to partners. 
And, exactly. and that I think is a, is a huge, mm-hmm. uh, that would be a huge shift in and of itself to think about that differently as a, um, and not just at the beginning stages of designing a product, right. As, as all throughout both the development of the product and then the rollout of the product and, and troubleshooting along the way, you know, as you find systemic inequities built within that unpacking that together as well as a partner partnership. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cause I, I think there's a really good example of this, of what not to do, <laughs> but mm. I, I like to actually learn from folks that are making efforts to do things more inclusively, but sometimes get things wrong because we, we can learn from that. And uh, this is an example, you know, I talk about this regularly, but I think there's just so many learnings to draw from the work of Nike. And so this is really more thinking about physical products, but there's a lot of analogies that can be made with any sort of digital product or service or any sort of technology that's being built. And, you know, what we can learn from, from them in terms of mistakes that they've made along the way is that they created, you may or may not have heard of this, but it's called the Fly East Go sneakers that came out about two years ago. It's the latest kind of model of these hands-free shoes, which initially had been designed much more in partnership with the disability community. But in this kind of second release of the shoes about six or seven years later, they really leaned into the marketing of hands-free shoe that anyone can use. Like if you're a mom at home that's running late for work and there's so much going on, you can just slip in your sh- your feet and do the shoes and kind of walk away, you know, walk away happy. And what kind of fell short in that is that once they actually brought the product to market, they didn't think about the price point and the accessibility of that price point, especially knowing that folks with disabilities, you know, if we think of things through the lens of intersectionality, they're likely to have lower rates of employment, uh, lower degrees of disposable income. There wasn't any sort of priority access that was imagined for them. When you think of even marketing and messaging, it was it really downplayed the fact that this was created with and for the disability community, uh, really emphasizing the kind of mass market appeal of the product, how we're making this better for everyone, but completely kind of, again, thinking back to that principle of inclusive design, of centering the voices and the perspectives of marginalized communities, they didn't do that because they opted for, you know, how can we build something scalable and profitable, but still kind of had the goodwill of the fact that it's going to also help folks with with disabilities. So to me, that's kind of an example of like, not just you have to think, like you said, about doing this work from the very beginning of the process. It it really has to also be cross-functional. So it's not just about the product design team building a product that ergonomically and in terms of materials or in terms of just the design itself can work for as many people as possible. But it's also thinking of, well, when we get that product into someone's hands, how are we thinking about those barriers to access and how can we start to decrease them, especially those who are going to be disproportionately affected? So in this case, those who are lower income or those who, for instance, don't even have an internet connection. They were only available online. So those sorts of things, you know, they touch on, for instance, the go-to-market teams, the marketing teams, the communications teams, PR teams, all these sorts of kind of, again, thinking of that interconnectivity, not just of these larger systems, but also within an organization. You know, how can we start to think of diversity, equity, inclusion through a holistic lens? Uh, And when it comes to the design of product services and technology, it's not just about the engineers and the designers, but about all sorts of folks, including the top decision makers, and making sure that that they're bought in and, and that they're supportive and sponsoring the work uh, from start to finish. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I want to ask another question here that we often work with global teams and mm. diversity, equity, and inclusion and systems of oppression even overall are seen as an American problem. so I know that you are in Paris and you work with a lot of European teams can you address that is it an American problem that's so fascinating and I I even had a conversation with someone on this very very recently where we didn't necessarily see eye to eye and I think that's that to me is actually the biggest takeaway is that my personal opinion on this is that there are Definitely a lot of parallels 
in what we see in a North American context in terms of history, in terms of the influence of political systems. So thinking about the legacies of colonialism, imperialism, all these sorts of things. This is a worldwide thing. And to be honest, we think of Eurocentrism, like the center is Europe. So for me, I like to, I kind of use my background in international relations. I like to kind of point back to history because it shows us that, you know, the origins of a lot of these uh, systems of domination and, and, you know, power, uh, exerting power over others stem from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, if not thousands of years ago. And that's something that, you know, the patriarch, you could say the cis heteropatriarchy is something that cuts across borders, unless you are talking about a matriarchal society, which few exist. I know there are some cultures that that do have those traditions and, and that sort of heritage. But if we're thinking of, um, I'm just thinking, for instance, of a European context in which I operate, those sorts of systems are very, very present. And the remnants of that can be found in the policies and the laws, in uh, the social norms. And it's something that I experience on a day-to-day basis being here in France, where the, for instance, the way that immigrants are, I don't want to say treated here, but the assumption is that immigrants should assimilate into the culture and should become French. And in a way, it kind of implies that you leave behind your own identity. And to me, that's already a power system in place that deems Frenchness, which Frenchness in a way, perhaps they'll never, they'll never uh, say this out loud, but we associated with, or at least I've experienced it, like technically I'm French on paper, but because of my accent, because of the way that I look and because of my life journey, I will never be seen as French. Even though the kind of, um, the French universalism kind of dictates that anyone who is a French citizen is seen as French and that should surpass any other identity such as race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. So to me, like the fact that I've personally experienced this, I see it show up day to day with the organizations I work with in my day to day life, to me shows me that shows us that racism and xenophobia and sexism and misogyny these cut across borders and we can still, even if race is defined differently in France or in Germany or in the UK compared to the US, we're still seeing social hierarchies and we're still seeing differences in terms of how people are treated. We're still seeing barriers. Perhaps the regulatory environment in each country might look different. Perhaps the social norms, like for instance, I've worked with Scandinavian clients. And they talk a lot about Scandinavian exceptionalism, meaning we're a socialist country. Everyone's equal. And -hmm. they have problems too. There is a racism problem. There is a xenophobia problem. And so to me, uh, it's important, again, to, in my opinion, to take the local and the regional context into account. But I personally am of the opinion that these larger systems cut across all countries, and they will just kind of manifest themselves a little bit differently in each. And so the approach does need to be personalized and localized, but the roots of it, in my opinion, are common across across the world. Mm, I agree. (laughs) I agree completely. Well said. So talking about those solutions, um, circling back to the solutions, and you talk specifically about how, you know, it's a huge problem and you're focused particularly on the learning side. Yeah. What are some things that that you do that you would recommend people think about as, in terms of the learning and the growth yeah. that needs to happen? Yeah. So I personally like to have people, as I would say, have people feel uncomfortable. But mm. what I mean by that, I mean, it's something uh, very similar to the work that we do in on the culture side of things. So with diversity, equity, inclusion. So uh, unpacking that power, the privileged bias. And there are, I think, some exercises that are helpful for designers in particular who assume themselves to be very neutral, to be very objective. And so what I like to do is kind of two sets of exercises. So 
one exercise is a positionality exercise, which folks might be familiar with, but it's actually being able to, for instance, take your design team or even look at a research panel. So people who are part of user research that you're doing or user testing and being able to identify the sorts of identities that are present and the identities that are not present and understanding kind of how that has an impact in terms of which sorts of user needs are we prioritizing, which voices are we potentially overlooking, whose voices tend to dominate the discussion, how does that tie to the sort of power that is associated with the social identity that person may have. Um, So I like to do kind of that first exercise. And a second exercise is actually bringing in folks. So I'll kind of unpack this. So a lot of times designers and and researchers, they do spend time listening to people's stories, but usually they have a lot of control over the storytelling because usually they have a set of questions that they ask someone. So if your set of questions isn't expansive enough or hasn't, haven't been debiased in a way to allow you to collect deeper and richer kind of insights. For me, one thing that I like to do is actually have folks who are part of marginalized communities come in and just have a chance if they feel safe and secure to do this or the conditions that you do this in really do matter. So making sure there's trust and confidentiality and even on an anonymity if if required, but having folks be able to tell their stories. So I did this, for instance, with a French coin where I had a panel of three people each representing very different intersectional identities. And I had just kind of some high-level questions I prepared ahead of time to have them tell us about their experiences with oppressive or with discriminatory or biased products and services. And instead of having the audience ask some questions, like I just had them speak freely, be able to ask questions to one another. I was able to kind of guide the discussion a little bit, but, but the goal was just to really be present. And to just have active listening and try as much as possible just to hit the brakes on those automatic kind of assumptions and biases that crop up and that desire to put people into personas and people into these kind of rigid frameworks. So those are kind of the two places I like to start with. So figuring out within the team or the sorts of people you work with, what identities are represented and all of the you know questions that, that cascade from that. And then on the other side is just practicing that active listening and shifting the power dynamics uh, so that you're not asking questions and focusing on you, but rather you're just there. You're just there to um, to learn and, and trying to foster that curiosity for others. And what I like to do as well is just kind of ask folks like, what were your immediate assumptions, even just when the people showed up in the room? <laughs> And then after you listen to them, you know, how were those assumptions or potential biases perhaps shifted? You know, mm-hmm. how how did they evolve? Was anything invalidated? Was anything surprising? And and I think just even having a conversation like that is a really good starting point to start to think a little bit more critically about, about how you do the work. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. So we're we're coming to the close of our conversation. And I wanted to ask you. Based on our conversation today, what action you would like people to take coming away from our conversation? Yes. So my number one action is in order for us to really be able to be more discerning about how oppression shows up in the design process and also in design outcomes. So design outcomes, meaning the product, the service, the technology that you're using, even on a day-to-day basis, is that you have to know what oppression looks like. And so what I like to do is to have folks as much as possible to start to notice patterns around them, start to kind of jot down, you know, oh, you know, I use the product. And if I were a person with a disability, for instance, would this product actually be as accessible? And if, and if I don't know this, maybe I need to go out and read or maybe go on Instagram or watch a video or a TED talk about a specific group or an intersectional identity group and just better learn about their experiences. So to me, it kind of starts from there. And what I've done is I've actually built the starter guide. It's kind of a free guide for folks that actually unpacks a variety of examples 
to show us day to day, for instance, the metro system in Paris, for instance, policies like gerrymandering and some different, I think even Apple Air tags and how those can mm-hmm. be used and abused by folks to enact harm and violence on others. And so it's kind of all of these myriads of ways of, of how the world around us can lead to inequitable and oppressive experiences, especially for marginalized groups. So to me, that that is the very first step. Afterwards, it's a question of, okay, unpacking. So doing that inner work. And then ultimately, the self-education that should be happening at the same time, leading up to, okay, small scale change, small behavioral changes on a day-to-day basis. And not again, looking to transform your design process one day after another. It's just not going to happen. But yeah, it just starts by being more mindful and being more discerning of how do those patterns show up and how can I start to eventually disrupt those patterns? Excellent. Where can people learn more about you and your work? Sure. So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, so uh, or you mentioned this, so my alias is Sandra by Design. So you can find me on all social media under the alias Sandra by Design, also sandrabydesign.com. And I run a community called the Inclusive Design Jam, and we have a lot of free resources within the academy of that community. The goal is just to try to get this education to as many people as possible. Uh, so you're welcome to join us in that community or just check out some of the free materials that we have to learn a bit more about the topic. Awesome. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for this All conversation. Right. And Thank we'll so add, much. yeah, and we'll add uh, the resources that we discussed in our show notes. So you can go to ally.cc and learn more about um, each of those resources and, and find those resources in our website or in the show notes of whatever podcast or YouTube platform you are using. And just a call to action to everyone, please do take action, deepen your empathy, do that internal inner work, know what oppression looks like, and learn to recognize where your products and services or the technology you use could be reinforcing systems of oppression, and then take action. All right, we will see you all next week. Thank you all for listening and watching. Thank you all. Thank you for being part of our community. You'll find the show notes and a transcript of this episode at ally.cc. There you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter with additional tips. The show is produced by Impovia, a trusted learning and development partner offering training, coaching, and a new e-learning platform with on-demand courses focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can learn more at impovia.co. That's E-M-P-O-V-I-A dot co. Allyship is empathy in action, right? So what action will you take today?